oh man you guys you guys are actually trying your best you know trying your best to use the little resources that you have you know as public hospitals to help you know this is the first time i've heard about that negotiation with private hospitals to lower their rates so that these especially aggressive cancers can go in and get these things done now do do you think the the government is doing something to at least you know you know increase some funds especially that can go towards cancer treatment to get these equipment and several of them especially a pet scan how can uh you know public hospitals not have pet can except ku is there something being done or it will just be in this space the same thing here in here out uh actually ku started doing the pet scan i think last year it was only aga khan by the way so only one in the entire country you can imagine that was a dire situation uh, so actually the government is trying uh, there's this new initiative uh, especially the the new in a, the new insurance cover that is coming up the social health insurance fund they're trying to create a fund which will uh, which will not only fund the patients but also the institution so that they can buy such equipment so in as far as um, I know, uh, there's that fund which is um, being put in place so that it can support facilities. They have made provision for that. So up to, we don't know when it will start, but it's our hope that it may start soonest so that, especially as you mentioned, Diana, a pet scan really, we, we would need one soonest in KNH, being the biggest referral hospital. Yeah, and even other machines like, um, the MRI, you might find uh, they're overburdened in our public facilities. As I mentioned to you, you realize patients can queue for up to three months. So even those need to be increased so that uh, the time it takes is much faster. The turnaround time for treatment is much faster. Oh, you know, I, I, I compare, there was a time I had some, um, you know, like sharp needles pressing my back at the top here. And I went to see a doctor who was concerned with the muscles and all that. And he, he, he contacted my oncologist. And the next thing I know, my oncologist was calling me. Must I do PET scan? They say, yes, you have to do PET scan. And the doctor asked for PET scan on that day. And the following day, I had the PET scan done. Like it was just hours in between. And that's what pains me as a Kenyan living here how advanced other regions are medically that a pet scan will be requested today and i can get it tomorrow morning some people can get it within the same day if it is not late evening and that pains me that people can queue for a pet scan because for someone to require a pet scan urgently in between it means the doctor feels or senses that cancer has spread maybe to another organ but it takes three months for that to be seen by the time the doctor is seeing that it is advanced you know and that is what the doctor wants to know has it gone to the lungs because when it is in the lungs there are certain chemo regimen or whatever they know that they can use when it's in the lung if it is in the liver if it's in the kidney there's something different they can use they cannot just start fighting something they don't know where it has gone to you know, and that causes me pain, especially when remembering a young lady who had breast cancer and they felt some, you know, lumps on her chest after mastectomy. But she was on queue for four months. She was told four months and she passed away before that time. And so I know so yeah, many cool. patients are passing away waiting for PET scan or waiting for MRI. You know, now someone asked for patients who have been diagnosed, is there... And, and they don't have money completely. Is there a certain fund that you guys have that can help them to start treatment or nothing? Um, what we have done is we have partnered with well wishers. Yes, uh, there are a few well wishers that assist, that help. And uh, I must mention, uh, Diana, unfortunately, is. Um, 
most of the organizations here in Kenya that support, uh, and, and also in Africa, because we, we do a lot of networking, that uh, support cancer treatments, mostly support treatments. Uh, like the ones I know, we have Faraja Cancer Trust, we have Safaricom Foundation, we have uh, the Rock and Lily Foundation. Most of them, they pay for the treatment itself. That is, uh, in their policy, they do not cover um, the scans and uh, the tests. You know, there are so many tests, immunohistochemistry, the blood tests, the PSA tests for prostate cancer patients, and many more. So those ones are not uh, mostly paid for by uh, the organizations. They mostly sponsor either chemo or radiotherapy. So it's often a bit difficult, especially when it comes to, to the scans and the tests. Uh, we do have a, a few individual well-wishers who support uh, the, the most compelling cases, the needy patients. Unfortunately, there's still a huge gap so which we haven't been able to meet so it's still a challenge to many patients okay so um you know i'm just so glad of course there is no fund in it yet but i've recently started in the organization i've started and i i said i will never call anything my name but i started the diana war uh, cancer diagnostic fund you know mm -hmm. and um I, I plan to launch it in july at the hope wow. gala I told you about the hope gala so at least now you've spoken about most organizations providing treatment you know chemo or radiation and all that hopefully this fund can grow to be able to to you know be able to help patients you know go for their scanning go for their blood tests and all that because you know let's let's ask the main question how how can you fund for a treatment for someone who does not even know what type of cancer they have, what stage it is. You want to help, but the way to that point has been blocked. The patient cannot afford diagnostics. The diagnostics are the main thing that should be done quickly so that the patient is staged and treatment now begins. You know, so hopefully I'm, I'm praying to God that the fund picks up. Now, I wanted to ask a question. I've seen another trend where... A patient is being treated, and I've looked at patient's documents and all that. Patient is being treated, but the patient has reached a point where the treatment is not working. But the hospitals are afraid to tell the patient the truth. So they keep the patient going round and round. Okay, oh, we had another one last year, early last year. And this is a case maybe you heard about. This young man that wrote to Safaricom to, to help, um, you know, take care of his son. Um, his name was, I'm forgetting the name of my patient, man, he was a young man. So this young man, we took him to Eldoret, you know, when he reached out to me right here on TikTok, and he told me about, oh, I'm, feel, I'm having some difficulty breathing, and I told him, you know, talk to me on the side, and we spoke on WhatsApp, and I said, you know, it seems that there's cancer in your lungs already. Please go to a hospital. And he went to Eldoret. And when he went to Eldoret, the doctors kept back and forth. Oh, we need to, to start chemotherapy, but your insurance is not accepting to pay right now. Oh, well, so I had to, to call in my, my guy in Eldoret, David, and tell David, you know what? Tell those guys that we are going to pay cash. And when they heard that we were going to pay cash, they disappeared. They were nowhere to be seen. I had to go to social media and look for any other doctor that works at Moi Referral and do it. And we got a family friend who apparently, it's so funny how things happen in this world. That time, this young man called Miles, his name was Miles. He had cancer that was initially, um, I don't know the name, but it had gone to the lungs. So it was dealing with the lungs, the lungs had collapsed. And the doctor that helped us to get the truth is right now going through uh, cancer treatment of brain cancer that went to the lungs. It just took a few months and the doctor herself is in the same situation. Sometimes she just needs somebody to read between the lines also to see God and see other things. But look, the doctors were going around until we put our feet on the ground and until Dr. Kwaba went and found the truth. They told us, Kwaba told us, her name is Edith Kwaba. She was on NTV this month. Um, 
she told us that you know what the oncologists have informed me that the the lungs have collapsed they cannot do chemotherapy they cannot do anything because the patient cannot breathe on his own so there is no treatment the patient is in his final days but they are telling this to dr rikoba they are refusing to tell this detail to the patient why for the patient they are taking them round and round they'll take them round until they pass away why is it that that trend is a lot in kenya here in some western countries in the u.s i know they tell us they normally like using certain words and they say you know what you need to put your house in order you need to put your things in order because time is up you have two weeks you have two months you have those two months may still be like three years because god is the one who decides but i i wish for kenya or africa or some place where the truth can be told and told in a kind way have you experienced this and what is your opinion what are your thoughts yeah uh this is a very common trend it still has not been solved fully and unfortunately in some hospitals uh it still goes on even in the public even in the private hospital i know yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. however uh, in the let me just give a good example of knh uh, I told you I work with uh, America Cancer Society and uh, I think uh, the staff at KNH have been trained by ACS and this was one of the issues which was addressed and nowadays patients are navigated. Unfortunately, the patient navigation program in the entire Africa is only in KNH, unfortunately. Yes, it was in Uganda but uh, it was closed down i think last year so kenya is the only program is the only uh, facility with a navigation program uh, we are really trying our best in the cancer space to try and uh, expand this uh, this is not to say that uh, other hospitals uh, don't tell patients the truth but uh, there's still a lot of um gap in this area it is often the case that patients are taken round and uh, i don't know why there is this belief that um, if you tell them the truth it will be much worse it's actually the other way around when they are not told the truth it's worse so uh, this is something that uh, is a problem and uh, we are really hoping to grow through the seminars the sessions we have we're really trying to do awareness on this patients should be told their diagnosis and not just diagnosis, but uh, the correct details, the truth about their situation. Yeah, yeah. because, you know, when they're told the truth, look, it will hurt, it will hit differently, but it will also help them to prepare. And yes. telling the truth normally is accompanied by the counselors that we talked about, that will help patients to go through and navigate that new dark spot and to know that look this is a journey for everybody this is a place that everybody will pass through i know what my therapist told me when i was going through therapy she told me you see the difference between cancer patients and other people is that cancer patients are, are, are facing you know the fact that they are mortal that they can die but other people who've not been diagnosed, you know, sometimes you cheat yourself, you think you'll be here forever. That's the only difference. But all those will pass away. Everybody born of a woman will pass away, you know. But just telling somebody the truth is recognizing the human dignity in that person. Because you're dignifying them and allowing them a chance to plan for their loved ones. Because if you tell me today that I have six months left, I will go into my files, I will call insurance, I will make sure everything is clear for my family so that there is nobody, you know, running around like a headless chicken <coughs> when I'm gone, you know. So that is the advantage of telling people the truth. Now, in, in just in concluding, what programs do you have for survivors or thrivers? I know you have the groups for um for cancer patients according to you know uh, prostate breast liver and all those do you have survivorship programs you know when, once patients have been treated and they're done 
Is there some kind of monitoring that is done for them? Do they come back after three months or six months or one year to be checked to see if um, there, there is reoccurrence happening or they are still safe? Uh, yeah, uh, this program is there. Um, in a number of public hospitals, uh, patients do come back. Uh, there's good survivorship where at least they are followed up. Uh, patients are often given appointments of um, perhaps come after three months when they see their prognosis good. They are told uh, come after six months. So I believe there's good survivorship on that. Uh, I see a good trend here. Yes. What of groups? Groups of survivors, you know, programs for them. To, because, you know, life after cancer, people normally think is the same. It's not the same. Because when you are with other people who have not gone through it, they don't expect you, they don't like when you talk much about it. I've even had my own brother telling me, ah, you keep talking about cancer. See, you already went through treatment and you are now fine. And I'm like, does this guy really know? For many people, there is nothing like fine. For many people, there is nothing like fine. Because after treatment, it's actually worse. Like Tracy Adams says, it is worse after treatment. Because you still think when you feel some pain somewhere, whoo, it is back. It is back. You know, and those groups of, of survivors, here I know, I belong to a survivorship. Uh, you know, there's a <coughs> there's an organization that brings in survivors. They teach you Spanish. There are some dances. You know some activities that keep people together. They journey together. You know I don't know if if there is any group or maybe. Yeah, uh Yes, uh, then unfortunately, we haven't been able to do much on the part of survivors, sorry to say, because I realize that our focus here has mostly been on uh, patients that are active on treatment, that are going on with treatment. We often have groups for them, but I think... Uh, Once uh, they have treatment, have... bye. Yeah, we do bye, unfortunately. We have not... We have not done much on the part of survivorship, especially follow up with groups. I think the only thing I mentioned is just appointments where they come after three months, clinical appointments, which is not enough. As you said, uh, uh, being a thriver yourself, uh, you mentioned that uh, mostly patients, it's not over yet. They want to talk about it. They want to debrief. They want to... They want to still meet others going through uh, the same situation and share. So uh, to be honest, uh, it is not much. Uh, the groups are not much. I think uh, we should plan on making efforts on uh, how we can make uh, the thrivers belong, have a sense of belonging much more than just uh, leaving them after we are done with treatment. Yeah. yeah, but you did you did mention Faraja. I've worked with Faraja. They are one some of the people we work with. And Faraja, you know, Faraja has groups for survivors. I know I did. I, I spoke to the, some of their groups in Eldoret last year, early last year. And they're also they're trying to do you know they're trying to do wonderful things with survivors and patients. So that one I'll really applaud them. But I know before we came live, we did speak, and I'm so glad that. I know we are going to do quite a lot together because for me, apart from the patients, you know, feeding the patients and the programming on patients, I'm very, very strong on the survivor side and then thriver side because I know those are people who are not understood. There are some that just decide, okay, you know what, I'm closing my mind. That was a chapter that was gone. I'm moving forward. I don't want to talk about cancer anymore in my life. But there are those that love to come together, like you've said, to be there for each other and to be there for those that are going through it afresh. You know, because doctors will, will tell you things according to science, social workers according to what they know. But the people who have journeyed, the people who have put on the same shoes you're starting to put on, they know how painful the body will be. They can tell you about the side effects they experience. They can tell you a lot that will help you through. They know what they used to help to 
relieve themselves of the pain. You know, like when someone comes to me and asks me, hey, I'm going for double mastectomy. What, what do you think? What note should I take? I say, hey, buy a recliner. <clears throat> That's one thing that I normally tell people. Buy a recliner mm. if you can afford. Because you will not be able to sleep on a normal bed for some weeks. It is painful. If you can afford a recliner, I was sleeping on my recliner like this for about a month. So that was mm. easy for me. You know, but it takes me who has been through that and somebody else told me and i made sure i had a recliner before i went in for surgery and i noticed the difference you know so i know that we are going to do a lot together and i really really wilson from the bottom of my heart i really thank you for creating this starting point i know with doreen and myself we are going to organize some meetings and we are going to do a lot to be able to help cancer patients and create a lot of awareness. What we really desire is to take this awareness to the grassroots.